Hey there, my name is Tiffany and I serve as the worship pastor here at Without Walls Church. And before we jump into this week's message, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us and being a part of our online family. Make sure you hit that subscribe button because we would love the opportunity to come alongside you and help you as you further your walk with Christ. But we pray that this week's message challenges you, encourages you, and equips you to be all that God has called you to be. Have a great week. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. Come on, there is nobody like our God. There is something about extravagant praise and extravagant worship that changes the atmosphere. Take your seat. So I want this morning, I have, I'm having some throat issues this week. I've had a sinus infection. So listen, if my voice is cracking or whatever going out, just it's all good. The anointing is still here. The presence of God is still here. But there is something about when we come in the house of God and we have extravagant worship and extravagant praise and we step outside. Thank you so much, sound people. You guys are amazing. And we step outside of our comfort zone and we step outside of our complacency and we say you know what I've gone so many Sundays this last year it is 2023 and I am making a commitment that I am not going to go I love the sound thank you another Sunday and give God a half-hearted a 10% a 5% a watered-down worship I am going to praise like I have never praised before I'm going to shout like I've never shouted before. I'm going to dance like I've never danced before. I am going to pray. I'm preaching to myself, y'all. I am going to pray this year like I have never prayed before. I am believing for this year I would have a holy addiction to the Holy Spirit. I am praying for this year that something would change in my life where I would be obsessed with the presence of God. I mean, imagine the Holy Spirit entertaining you more than TikTok. Imagine coming to your husband or coming to your wife and saying, I don't know what's going on with me. All I want to do is pray. All I want to do is fast. I have lost my desire for food. I have lost my desire for TV. I have lost my desire for Instagram. I have lost my desire for Facebook. I have lost my desire to go to the movies. Not legalistic. Not legalism. But I'm obsessed with this man and I would rather be in his presence than to be anywhere else. I'm telling you guys, we are this year, I believe, going back to our first love. We are going back to a place of holy obsession to God. I came into the church as an atheist 12 years ago. My little sister begged me, just go to church now. I sympathize with some of you that somebody brought you, drug you here. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're another religion. Maybe you're like, why is this guy shouting? Why are there veins coming out of his neck? Friend, I'm half Hispanic, half Italian, so just get over it, okay? If I have any Hispanics in the house, we are loud. If I have any Italians, we talk fast. But understand that it's transcendent. It's not just my culture, but the Holy Spirit has so changed my life that I'll never be the same. The Holy Spirit has so changed my life, I lost my desire to please people. See, you cannot be a God chaser and a people people pleaser at the same time. You cannot have the fear of God and the fear of man at the same time. So I got to a place where I said, I don't care what anyone thinks. I don't care if people think I'm weird. I don't care if people are confused why I'm taking big deep breaths in between my message. I don't care if people call me crazy because the reality is that I am crazy for the presence who am I preaching to? And the power of God. I am crazy to see revival. I wish I had somebody that was Pentecostal in here. I'm crazy to see revival in America. I'm crazy to see awakening in the church. So I came in as an atheist. I said, God, I don't effing believe in you. Isaiah Saldivar 
said the F word at the altar because I was so far from God. I didn't come in wanting to serve God. In fact, when I stepped foot in the door of the church, I said, this will be the last time I come to church ever again. Mind you, I was raised 16 years in the church, decided to become an atheist, thought I was going to be cool. And then three years, never went to church, went one time, almost four years, went one time, walked through the door, said, I'll never step foot in a church again after today. And friend, I came to an altar drawn by the Holy Spirit. I said, God, I don't effing believe in you, cussed at the altar. And I said, but if you are real, and I mind you, I didn't think he was real. So I'm like, I'm going to say some crazy stuff because it does not matter. I didn't realize that what I was about to say was going to change the eternal trajectory of my destiny. I'm not talking about, oh, this is life changing. The gospel is not just life changing. The gospel is eternity changing. This takes you from going from spending an eternity in a lake of fire, eternal torment, to an eternity with God in his presence. I was on my way to hell, first class tickets, business seats, and God changed the trajectory of my eternity. And the reason why I'm so compelled to preach this, as you can see, I'm not reading notes this morning, is because there are people here that are on the edge of eternity. You think you have time to get your life together. You think I have another Sunday. Friend, believe me, you don't have another Sunday. You don't have another 13 minutes. Now is the day of salvation. This is the moment to say, I got to get right with God. I have to get my act together. I don't have time to play church any longer. I said, God, I don't have to believe in you, but if you're real, I'll move out of state. I'll break up with the girl that I'm with for four years. I'll leave my job that I'm pursuing in law enforcement. I'll literally leave everything. Now, I didn't know that there was a biblical reality that if any man wants to follow me, now, some of you aren't going to like this because you grew up in organized religion. And friend, hear me, you can grow up in church and not grow up in God. And you never heard somebody tell you that you actually have to die to self. Like you have to actually surrender everything. This idea that God is some accessory, some side fry on your mill or your life, that God is some trinket that you wear where you can kind of just, and this is America where we are in the church, you can kind of just live your life and then, you know, sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on the, on Sunday morning and kind of just add Jesus to whatever you're doing. Like that's the life we live. Get a good job, get a good car, have a nice house, get, make 70 to $80,000 a year, have a few kids. And then when you're like 35, get involved in some small group at church. This is a far cry from the gospel that Jesus preached. See, what I didn't realize is that Jesus was calling me to die to every desire, every ambition, every addiction, every dysfunction, everything that I had planned for my life. God said, I want you to lay it down. And here's why, because what I have, if you only knew this morning, the plan and the destiny that God has for your life, it is infinitely greater than any plan that you have. Can y'all hear me this morning? It is infinitely greater than any desire that you might have. The plan that you have for your life is worthless compared to God's plan. In fact, let me make a bolder statement that Paul made. If you're living your life right now and you're not fully living it for God, your life is absolutely worthless. Paul said, my life is worthless if I don't use it for fulfilling the call and preaching the gospel that God has for me. Friend, you were not put on this earth. And me and pastor were talking about this yesterday. I am, I, I feel like I'm way too young to be thinking about crossing the finish line in my, the, my, the end of my life. But you know what I realize? You're never too young to think about something that's a blink, of, a blink of an eye away. See, the Bible says that our life is not long at all. In fact, our life is but a vapor, the Bible says. Our life is fleeting. And as I'm preaching, you are breathing one breath closer to eternity that you might be 70 or 80 in this room. And every one of us would say the same thing. Isaiah, my life has gone by so fast. Can y'all, if you're in your, uh, in your 60, 70, 80, wave at me if you'd agree that life has gone so fast. Like I literally blinked and my life is over. 
and I'm 31 years old and I felt like I was just sitting in the DMV getting my driver's license. Here I am now married for 10 years. I have four beautiful children. I've been preaching the gospel, traveling the country for 12 years now and I feel like I literally blinked and it's over. But the reality is, are you trying to scare me? Absolutely. The reality is I'm going to blink again and I'm going to be sitting on my deathbed, hopefully surrounded by my kids and ground grandkids. And I'm not going to be saying, I wish I can go back and watch more TikTok. I'm not going to be saying, I wish I can go back and get a and have a better career. I'm not going to be saying, I wish I would have picked up that overtime. I'm preaching strong this morning. I wish I would have picked up that overtime shift. I'm not going to be saying, I wish I would have just took my family to the movies more. I'm not going to be saying, I wish I would have done more drugs and went to more parties. I am going to sit on my deathbed, hopefully surrounded by my kids and grandkids, saying I ran the race well. I finished the fight. I fought the good fight. I did all that God had for me to do. All that God had for me to do. And I'm looking at my life and I'm being vulnerable this morning. I'm preaching prophetically and I had a whole message and y'all know every time I have a message planned, God's like, preach something else. I'm like, you should have told me that last night when I was up all night trying to go over notes, stressed out. I had my, I have my, I had my life planned out. Friend, I was 16 years old, graduated high school. Again, no plan to share my testimony, but God's leading me and I follow his lead, not your lead. 16 years old, I graduated high school. 19 years old, I graduated college. I'm getting a, a job as a deputy sheriff. I had a car. I had the girl. I was taking 19 units in school. I was working 40 hours a week. I was successful in the eyes of the world. I had my 30 year plan. I knew everything I was going to do and God was nowhere in my plan. Friend, I know what it's like to have your life planned out and God be nowhere in your plans. And maybe you're just here checking it out or maybe you saw us on YouTube or maybe your family drug you here and you're like uncomfortable. That's good. That's, that's God calling you. That's God pricking your heart. That's the surgical knife of the Holy Spirit. That's the word of God that cuts between bone and marrow and spirit and changes and challenges. You got to stop going to these cupcake soft churches with these jelly bean sour patch kid pastors that are preaching this watered down word. And you got to get in the house of prophetic voices that are going to call you to another level, that are going to call you higher. I'm tired of people telling me my sin is okay. I want to get uncomfortable for God. My whole life was planned out and no interest in God. And then all of a sudden I'm at this altar and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob called my name, said, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. Friend, do you understand how powerful it is that the God of the universe knows your name? That there are now, I think, 8 billion people. I think we just crossed 8 billion or 7 billion. I don't know, somewhere around there, people on this earth. And the Bible says this about you. It says that God, oh man, this is so crazy. I'm blessing myself this morning. It says that God's thoughts about you, they outnumber. Now, this is not God being facetious or God exaggerating. Exaggeration is another form of lying. We don't need to put sauce on it. This is what he says. He says, my thoughts about you outnumber the sand on the seashores. If you went to the beach and there was a trillion, well, there's way more than a trillion. There was 30 trillion pieces of sand on one area, one mile radius of the beach. And then God says, okay, that's a lot, three trillion things thoughts. I mean, that's absolutely crazy. There's no, there's no way, but God says, I'm going to take a step further. It's not just the sand on one seashore. It's the sand on all the seashores. And guess what? My thoughts about you are greater. They actually, they're not just, oh, this is crazy. They're not just the thoughts on the seashore, but they actually outnumber the thought the, the sand on the seashore. So that means God is thinking about me. So why am I not thinking about God? God has great plans and thoughts about me and God's thoughts about me are not just like, oh, I really love them. I really care about them. Those are some of the thoughts, but God's thoughts about me are kind of like the thoughts that I have about my kids, the thoughts that I have about my four girls, which I love so much. And I'm obsessed with the thoughts I have about my four daughters is not just, I love how they do this. I love this, but my thoughts are also, I hope they become this when they grow up. I hope God does this in their life. And so they're not just now thoughts, they're 
future thought. And what I want to bring you this morning is that we have a God who is absolutely obsessed with us. Now, don't say he's not, because if I thought about you and my thoughts were more than the sea, sand on the seashore, that would be the level of obsession. We have a God that is obsessed with his church, that is obsessed with his people. Well, how do you know God's obsessed? Because God said in John 3, 16, that I'm so obsessed with you that I took action by sending the most valuable thing I had, and that was my only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And God does all of this for you, and you're going to act like he's not that big of a deal. How, how dare you? Just come for an hour on Sunday morning and give God a little shout and a little scream for 30 minutes and then ignore him all week long. How dare you spend eight hours on screen time, but zero time in prayer, zero time in the, in, in the God's word, zero time fasting. Now, some of you are getting off of a 21 day fast and you're starving, but I want your hunger for God to far exceed your hunger for food. I want your desire for God. Friend, when I got saved, I I, and again, I'm not recommending the stuff that I'm telling you to do. This was my experience. Maybe, well, some of y'all need it, but this was my experience. I literally didn't eat for two entire weeks. Now, it wasn't a fast. I didn't even know what fasting was. I was an atheist. God said, Isaiah said my name, changed my life. I had my encounter and I didn't eat for two weeks. And my mom said, Isaiah, you, my mom, yeah, my, I was going to say my, my mom, but I said it wrong. My mom said, Isaiah, you need to eat or you're going to die. And I was so obsessed with God that I convinced myself I never needed to eat again. Okay. I was like, I'm not going to eat. She's like, you're going to die. I was like, I'm not eating. I don't live by food. I live by the will of the father. I have food you know not of. My food is doing I was like quoting it and then I was like okay I I might end up dying I was getting really sick and so I had to start eating again but literally and now I'm not trying to be super spiritual please if if this is coming off as me bragging or a weird flex it's not at all what it is it's me showing you that there is a level that we can get to in God that I want to be at I want to go higher today I want to level up I it can't be that I'm coming in the church anxiety depression fear addiction religion dysfunction I'm coming in this house where I am telling you the presence of God is so strong in this house. The pre- I'm t- I was shaking the whole worship set. I'm like this the whole time. I don't know. I'm like, why am I shaking? Because the Bible says the mountains shake at his presence. People are like, oh, that whole shaking thing, that's demonic. I don't know. If, I just know I'm not bigger than a mountain. I'm not even the size of a boulder. And yet the mountains shake at the presence of God. So who do you think you are to tell him, oh, that shaking stuff and oh, you know, loud worship. It doesn't take all that. Look where you're at. Like, I don't know why you shout that way. I'm like, you should try it. You're so dead. I mean, seriously, I have all these religious Pharisees they make YouTube videos about me. This guy's always screaming and shouting. And I'm like, you should try it. You are so dead. There's no, there's no spiritual life in us. Like when we talk to people, they're not convinced because we don't have charisma and passion. Now you might say, well, brother, that's just your personality. Wrong. It's the Holy Spirit. I never, I wasn't charismatic. I was depressed. I was, I was in the, I was hiding. I didn't even like people. Friend, I was so lost. This is a true story. I loved physical darkness. I used to, my mom would always say this growing up, I never wanted the lights on. Number one, I never wanted pictures taken of me. There's literally probably five pictures of me from the ages of like eight years old to the ages of like probably 17, 18. I would never allow pictures. Every family picture, my dad literally said one day when I was a teenager, you're never, you're going to literally at your funeral have no pictures of you. Like it's, a, he, he was like, you, you won't let us. I didn't take pictures. I didn't make eye contact with people. I love the darkness. Now I didn't know why. I didn't know why I couldn't make eye contact. I didn't know why I couldn't take pictures. I didn't know why I love darkness. My mom would say, you need to turn the light on. I kid you not. I would shower in the dark. I would get ready in the dark. Everything I did, my room was always dark. I loved the darkness, not even realizing there was unclean spirits. I didn't know anything about demons living in me that were causing me to be a certain way. See, because there is 
a plan the enemy has for you and then there is a plan that God has for you God's plan is to bring you out of the darkness see when God delivered me from that unclean spirit of shame the unclean spirit of lust when God delivered me from those demons I was able to make eye contact I was able to talk to people I was able to so don't sit here and go oh that's just your personality it's because I've been delivered come on help me this morning it's because I've been set free it's because do I have anybody in this house that says I could never praise before but now I could praise now I could shout now I could worship well brother God's not deaf tell that to blind Bartimaeus the only people that say that garbage is religious people Calm down, brother. God can hear you. God's not deaf. And blind Bartimaeus, you know what the Bible says when they told him that? He shouted even louder. Why? Because he was more desperate for revival. He was more desperate for healing. He was more desperate for deliverance than he was for approval. And I'm at the place in 2023 where I just don't care anymore, where I want passion for God. I want hunger for God. I want a desire for God like I've never had. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, now because you're in Christ you are a new person the old life is gone a new life has begun I'm telling you there is a new life for 2023 of passion a little bit more if you can in the mic of desire and of hunger for God this is what we're stirring up this morning in January. I believe it's, there's a reason why I wasn't able to come in December. I got sick and God wanted me here in January. We are starting this year with such an obsession for God. No one is going to recognize you any longer. I was just this, I'm telling y'all, please hear me. I am in a spiritual revolution right now. I am so, I have such an unquenchable thirst for God. I look at David in Psalms 42 where he said, my soul is thirsty like a deer pants for water. So my soul longs for the living God. David said, where can I go and stand before him and then David said my heart is breaking David why is your heart breaking and David said my heart is breaking because I remember how it used to be I used to lead the worship the funeral the, the uh, church service procession I used to stand in the house of God and sing songs of joy but that passion that I once had that desire that I once had it's now gone I've lost my passion for the word I've lost my hunger for God and this morning God is going to restore and God is going to relight the passion and relight the fire I'm talking about hunger for God like you've never had before I'm so tired of hunger for Instagram hunger for TikTok living my life you know I was at this conference years ago it was a martyrs conference I'm like I don't even know why I'm here I felt like I'm not even saved I literally didn't feel saved at this conference it was voice of the martyrs and I'm sitting at this conference and I'm just trying to like blend in because I'm like I feel pathetic compared to these people and they're getting up there talking about how they were tortured in Iran and tortured in China all these speakers had been persecuted they all had scars some of them were missing limbs and they all had marks of Christ on them I'm not talking about someone throwing you a, a tomato at you I'm not talking about somebody oh someone made fun of me on Facebook I'm not talking about the stupid persecution we have in America I am talking about people that were literally physically marked for the gospel and I remember one of the speakers was from Iran and he said I was in an Iran prison for I think 10 years being tortured and, and going through it for Christ he said he got released and then he, he came out on a basically like a, a I forgot what it's called like a religious persecution visa I forget asylum religious asylum and so he was able to go from Iran he got released out of that 10 year sentence of being tortured and literally scars all over his body he was showing all over his back they were burning him with cigarettes and all the stuff that you wouldn't believe he said and I got home and I, I got a religious asylum to America he said and then when we got to America I got assimilated into an American church and I was just going through the motions and then one day he said I came to my wife crying and say honey I long to go back to that prison in Iran he said honey it is so hard to be a Christian in America it is so hard because of the destruction he said I was so much think about this I was so much closer to God when I was in a prison cell being tortured than I am with a nice job in America there is something about comfort there is something about religion there is something about comfortability that 
numbs us to the presence of God. See, the enemy wants to stop you from living out the full destiny that God has for your life. The devil wants you to worship the God of convenience while adding a little bit of Jesus onto that, thinking you're fine, but really being a thousand miles from God. But I believe today God is going to give us a holy obsession, a holy addiction, where you're going to thirst. I thirst for the living God. I wake up and I'm, God, I'm so thirsty. This year, I'm like, Lord, I don't know how much closer I can get. I want more. I'm not praying like I should. I'm not fasting like I should. I'm not desperate enough. In fact, this year I've been saying, I don't even think about you enough. And I remember as an atheist, I sat in that church and one of the lines the preacher said, I ended up making fun of. He said this line, he said, some of you are gonna get so obsessed with God, he's gonna be the last thing you think about before bed and the first thing you think about in the morning. And, I, and listen, listen, hold on, listen, hold your clap because this is not a good part to clap. I, I made fun of that preacher when I heard that. I said, this is, this is the lamest guy I've ever heard. I literally said that to myself. I said, why would I ever think about God? Because I grew up in a religious church. I said, why would I think about God? Because you know what? In my mind, when he said that, and I was an atheist before I got saved, I thought in my head, the last thing, truthfully, the last thing I think about before bed is either drinking or getting with girls. That's who I was. And the first thing I think about is drinking and getting with girls. I, have, I would never, ever think, why would you think about God? See, some of you in this room, what I'm preaching is so far detached because this is religion to you. So you're like, you think about God outside Sunday? I mean, what is there to even think about? Why would I put my mind on heavenly things? Do you know why so many of us are battling with mental illness, anxiety and fear and racing thoughts and panic attacks? Because your mind is on demonic things, dark things, things that don't matter, things that stress you out. You're feeding yourself the things of this world. But the Bible says, think on heavenly things. Don't think on things that are below, but think on things that are above. And friend, I sat there thinking he was crazy. I ended up getting saved that night. And 12, please hear me again. I'm not weird flexing. I just want to show you. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. 12 years later, I can't remember a day where he wasn't the first thing on my mind. And the last thing on my mind. I'm praying for 2023 to have this obsession with God where he's what I live for. He's what I thirst for. He's what I long for because without the thirst, you can't get the Holy Ghost. Now, I love what Pastor Ken said because it transcends just coming and praying a prayer and saying, Jesus, come into my heart. There's a lot of, how do I say this? Um, religious denominations that teach this just come to the altar pray a prayer you get the holy ghost automatically and leave the same and do whatever you want yet when we read the gospels we actually see transforming power when the holy spirit comes upon you paul came to ephesus and paul did not say oh you guys should pray a prayer paul came and said have you received the holy spirit and the believers that's what the bible calls them at ephesus said we've not even heard that there is a holy spirit and he says well how are you baptized they so we were baptized in John's baptism, which was the baptism of repentance. Some of you have been baptized into repentance. In other words, you have repented of your sin, you've changed the way that you think, and you followed God. But what you're missing is the element of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's where you begin to hunger for the Word of God. That's where you begin to hunger for prayer. That's where you have a desire to worship. That's where you volunteer to help at the church. You don't have to be asked why, because my people will be volunteers in the day of my power. We are in the time where God is saying, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when you just have repentance and no Holy Spirit, you end up with religion. You end up with rules and regulations and no, I, I hope, I'm, in thir I'm, I'm 25 minutes and I hope you're catching what I'm saying. You have no spiritual desire for the things of God. 
So this year I'm going, Lord, I want, and this is just me and I'm just sharing my heart with you guys because this is my second church and I'm family and I can do whatever I want because I have the mic. I'm saying, Lord, I want my heart to be filled. I want my mind. I'm, I'm going, Lord, how do I get to this level where you're the only thing that matters, where you are? People say, you should take a sabbatical. I'm like, what do you mean? He is my sabbatical. He's my vacation. He's my refuge. I've lost desire for anything else. Now, I'm, again, I'm not being super spiritual, but 12 years later, I still don't like eating food. Look at, look at my wrist. I want you guys to all put that camera on my wrist. Okay, my daughter has about the same size wrist as me. I'm 130 pounds soaking wet on my best day. And they said, oh, brother, once you get married, all the Italian moms tell me, once you get married, you're going to gain tons of weight, mijo, don't worry. And I got married. It's been 10 years. I'm still waiting for the weight to show up. Oh, brother, once you have kids, you're going to gain weight. Trust me, your metabolism is going to slow down. I have four kids now. I mean, how many kids do you want me to have? I have four kids now. I still haven't gained any weight. And I still, the hunger, the desire for hunger that I had before I was saved, I no longer have. My hunger now is for God. And so it's now like, and it's not, it's a weird tension because I'm like, it's not healthy to eat once a day. But then the other side of me is like, maybe this is just the, maybe this is just the plan that God has on my life. Maybe God just wants me to be this person that is just going after him and doesn't care and doesn't have time. And maybe God wants me to be a spectacle. In fact, Paul said, I stay up all night long just to beat my body into subjection. Paul was purposely staying up all night just so that his body knew I'm in control of you. And I I am knocking King Stomach off of his throne and I'm going to tell my flesh what to do. I'm going to live my life for God and everything else doesn't matter anymore. So I lost my desire. Now, it, I'm not saying you're not saved if you love to eat, okay? Praise the Lord. Do what you got to do. Just don't be a glutton because it's a sin. Lost my desire to eat. But along with that, lost my desire to watch movies. And again, I'm not saying this so that you're like, oh man, if I watch movies, I'm going to hell. That's not at all what I'm saying. This is not legalism. This is holiness. Legalism is what you do for men to see. Holiness is what you do for God to see. I am telling you, when I got saved, I lost my desire for movies. I lost my desire to listen to worldly music. I lost my desire to look at women. I lost my desire to play video games. I lost my desire to go out and do anything. When me and my wife got married, we didn't even know what to do. We just prayed and had church 24 seven. Like, we don't know what to do. We we don't like going to movies. We don't like watching TV. We didn't even have a TV for year after year after year. We don't like going out. We don't do, there's nothing to do. Why? Because revival actually ruins the everyday normal life that the world is trying to give you. And revival takes the focus off of pleasuring myself, doing things for myself, getting ahead in my career for myself to now everything else becomes secondary. So now it's no longer like I eat and I go to movies and I watch TV and I live for myself and then I had God on Sunday now it's God 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 and then I add the movies I add eating when I have time I all these other things I add on because I am obsessed I'm single focus on the presence of God I don't know if I'm the only one but I'm believing for 2023 that my thoughts would be on him that my obsession would be on him that God would deliver you some of you you don't need deliverance from demons. You need deliverance from this. You need deliverance from the apple. When Adam and Eve ate the apple in the garden, and God says, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's knowledge there. Do you know there's knowledge here? This thing is full of knowledge that shows good and shows evil. That we are living in a generation where we literally believe everything we hear. And we literally believe everything we read. Every time you get on the news. I mean, some of y'all. Oh, I, got, I can't say this because I know it's on YouTube. So they're going to make videos about me. But some of y'all, y'all believe some crazy stuff. I'm just going to leave it there before we get banned. Some of y'all believe, and you could let your mind do the wandering. Some of y'all believe some crazy stuff that you saw on the news. You watch the news. You're like, did you hear about it? And I'm like, that's not even real. That's fake. Half the stuff the news is showing us is fake anyways. And we believe everything we read. We believe everything we hear. But the problem is in the world, we believe everything we read. But then when we read the Bible, we don't believe anything. If we believe everything we read, why don't we start reading the Bible? Because some of y'all, oh, how can I say this? You believe the earth is flat, okay? We're not going to judge you. And I, I know a lot of you do because I post on my stream. Who believes this? And like a lot of you do. Okay, you have no problem believing that. But you don't believe that you can cast out devils? You don't believe that you can lay hands on the sick? You don't believe that you can raise the dead? 
You don't believe that you have power to say no to that sexual immorality. You don't believe that you have power to say no to that addiction. Friend, you have more power than you realize. Why? Because the Bible says, these signs shall accompany them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. They shall speak in other tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick. I'm going to start believing the Bible. I'm not going to believe CNN. I'm not going to believe Fox News. I'm not going to believe whatever it is. I'm going to believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If it's in the word, I believe it. I believe it. Many of you believe that you're going to die and go to heaven one day. And you should believe that. A lot of people believe that in the church. But you don't believe that you can have heaven here? You don't believe that you can? You're like, oh yeah, people come to me. I don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in miracles. I'm like, well, it don't matter because you're not the Bible. I don't believe in signs and wonders. I don't believe, as if like your belief matters at all. It literally doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. God's so, you think God's out there like, oh, well, Shelly doesn't believe in it, Paul. You know, Holy Spirit, so we can't do it. God could care less. God will move with or without you. You just get to be either a participant or you get to be a spectator. I want to be a participant in this great revival that is happening. I want to be a part of what God is saying and what God is doing. So I, I talk to people like, I don't believe in miracles. I'm like, you don't believe God can use a person to heal another person. The Holy Spirit could work through us because truth is we're not the one doing the work. You don't believe that, but you believe that you're going to die, be resurrected, your soul and your spirit are going to go to be with God for all of eternity. Yeah, I believe that. Yet you don't believe that God's power is available now. Friend, how many of us are going to stand on judgment day with eternal regret as to why we didn't do all the things that God had for us to do? My message is we need to go back to our first love. We need to break out of the normalcy of religion. Now, the beauty of this church is I could literally preach as strong as I I want because the name is without walls church okay if the name was first calvary i had to be a little scared i'm like well i can't say too much the name is without walls that means our desire is not to try to get you in the church it's to try to get you out of the church the best time is when we dismiss you and we lose you into the harvest because the issue is not bringing them in the issue is laborers going out to the harvest the bible didn't say bring them to church it said bring the church to them god wants to send you out as a without walls church to be his hey oh who am i preaching to to be his hands to be his feet and to be his mouth in the earth just like the church in Ephesus God writes this letter through John in Revelation chapter 2 I'm going quick here and God writes a letter through John sends John sends this letter to a physical church and God comes and says I am the one that holds the seven stars in my hand now the letters to the pastor the messenger but it's not just to the pastor it's to the entire congregation and God has an indictment against the people and the indictment was I am holding the seven stars in my hand in other words God is the one supporting the church the church is not the one supporting God see we have it backwards instead of God God having us in his hand we think that God's in our hand instead of us following Jesus we think Jesus should follow us instead of inquiring with God before we make decisions we make decisions and ask God to bless our mess but the biblical order is this seek first the king come on a little bit more in the, in the, in the mic seek first the kingdom of God and what gets added all these things will be added unto you. I don't know why my life's broken, because you're out of order. I've used, I've used many vending machines in my life, okay? I've lived in airports and hotels. I'm the king of vending machines, okay? When a vending machine says out of order, why would I go invest my money into that? I know if I invest into this, I'm gonna get nothing in back. So I'm not even gonna waste my time. Yet you think your life could be out of order and God will keep investing into you. God is investing his spirit into us and well, God doesn't, you know, God, God cares. 
The parable of the talents was this. I don't give it to you in five seconds. I've invested into you. You've produced nothing for me. Give me back what I gave you. God is looking for a return on his investment. Do you think he sent his only son just so that we could play church and sing a few songs? He sent his only son so that you can be Christ's ambassadors in the earth. Jesus said, I must go to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to lead you into all truth and make you like me. So Jesus said, I'm going to live. By the way, Holy Spirit's name is Holy. Okay, Spirit is not a name. His name's Holy. God says, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. I'm going to invest in you. But here's the order. Now, this is going to help you because there's people come to me with a thousand issues. My this is messed up. My kids are messed up. My husband's messed up. My car's messed up. My tire's messed up. My house is falling apart. I mean, a thousand other issues. And I'm like, okay, well, what are your priorities like? It's like, well, I do all this stuff and then I, I give God a five minute prayer before bed. Here, here's the thing. Everything else, what is the order of your life? We all have an order. Everything else is first. God's at the end. And God says, I can't invest or bless things that are out of my divine order. And my divine order is, I have to be first in your life. And if you seek my kingdom first, all the other thousand issues you're going through will be added if you seek me first. Now, Getting out of bed and checking my phone is not seeking God first. Going to bed on my phone is not seeking God first. Giving God one hour on Sunday morning. In the last month, have we prayed? No. Have we cried out to God? No. Well, some of us, because it's January, it's like the gym. Like, we're going to go for a month and then just back and then just not go anymore for the rest of the year. I'm talking about being so on fire for God that every single day this year, you wake up and say, I'm going to take it one day. Well, that's overwhelming, brother. This is how you do it. You don't worry about tomorrow, for today has enough worries in itself. I'm going to teach you how to live. There was instability built into the disciples' life. There was, you know, you know the word that we could describe Christianity? Difficulty. Difficult. This is what Jesus said difficult is the way that leads to life. It's narrow. Easy is the way that leads to death. So difficulty is ingrained into the Christian life. Instability is ingrained in the Christian life because the Christian life is not a 10 year plan. It's a daily decision to follow Jesus. Paul said that I die daily. God is looking. And so I found if I don't want to be overwhelmed, I take one day at a time. I wake up in the morning. God I give you everything. And this is what I do. I've literally been, and, and I'm, I'm not even near, trust me, y'all, I'm not near where I want to be. I'm, you pro, I'm probably, in your eyes, 10 times more on fire than I, I actually am in my personal life. Let me say that again, because y'all are like, did he just say that? I'm probably 10 times more on fire in your eyes than I am in my everyday life. There is so much lukewarmness in this vessel. There is so much complacency in this vessel. There is so much compromise in this vessel. And I am saying, God, I am striving. Remove me. Remove the compromise. Remove the lukewarmness. I want every waking moment. I, why? Because it goes back to what I opened with. Life is too short to waste it. Like, I'm looking back going, man, the last 12 years have been a blur. Have I really? And I know some of you are like, if Isaiah's not, I don't know what I'm going to do. If I, have I really given everything? How much time have I wasted on things that don't even matter and arguing with people and wasting time watching something or going somewhere? How much time have I spent? I'm, I'm a failure when it comes to training my kids. I'm a failure when it comes to prayer. I'm a failure. I'm going, God, I need you. See, I look at myself as this and then I lean on God every day and say, God, I can't get out of bed without your spirit. I can't talk without your spirit. I woke up this morning and was like, Lord, I can't get out of this bed. Literally, I can't get out of this bed if your spirit's not with me. I refuse to go anywhere without you. I need your Holy Spirit every waking moment. I'm aware of your presence. I'm aware of your power. I'm in love with you. I mean, how far is too far in God? I want that passion. I want that fire. I want that first love encounter. And so here God is writing, here Jesus is writing through John to this church. And he says, I'm writing you. I'm the one that walks among the seven lamps. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am walking among the church. I'm not like detached. I'm not far off. I'm not like not there. Jesus walks among among our churches. And sometimes I, I travel these churches and I wonder if we'd have to explain to Jesus what we're doing. One person caught that. Thank you, Pastor Dina. 
I wonder if Jesus would be like, oh, what are we doing now? It's like, oh, well, this is the part where we have to beg everyone to give. And this is the part where, you know, we do this. And this is the part where, you know, we preach. And this is the three minute all. And then Jesus, your time is at the end for one minute when we, you know, people get prayer. But the rest of the week is kind of, like, you know, when Jesus is like, well, what do y'all do throughout the week? Like, imagine if Jesus interviewed you. It's like, okay, so you're here praising. And I mean, it's a cool building. I love, I love it all. I love lights. I think they're doing 10 out of 10. He goes, but like, this is great. But what do you do when you go home? Like, so what is your Monday like? And you're like, well, I mean, I didn't really think that far. I just kind of survived till Sunday. This is not about survival. This is about revival. We're not, this church is not on life support. We're not trying to get here and, oh, I'm just barely crawling in. I just need another shot in my arm to survive the week. We are here as more, not even just conquerors, and more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, where we are taking this city by force. We are, come on, help me preach this morning. We are taking our jobs by force. We are taking our families. There, here's the truth. There's somebody waiting for you to wake up to this thing. You have a family right now in the hospital. You have a family member right now in a mental hospital. You have a family right now in a physical hospital. You have a family right now in a trap house. You have a family right now working as a prostitute. You have a family right now on drugs. You have a family right now addicted. You have a family member right now that is thinking about taking their own life. And how dare you act like and come to this church and act like the same spirit that raised Christ is not in you. It is time for you to stop saying, oh God, will you do it? go do it? And God says, no, you go do it. I have given you my Holy Spirit. I have given you. Stop saying. I've been trying to get to this message. Y'all just keep shouting. Stop saying, God, where were you? Because God might say that right back to you. One day I was saying, God, where are you and my friend and family? And God's like, where are you? I've given you my Holy Spirit. What are we even praying for? Some of these prayers we're praying. I'm like, Lord, save the city. He's like, what building? I mean, do you want me to say the Walmart building? We are called to go out and do the work. Some of us are praying prayers that we are the answer to. Like, Lord, please reach my neighbor. And God's like, or just walk over there and share your faith with them. I mean, it's like so much, Lord, please, please, please deliver my husband. God's like, you literally sleep next to him every night. Why don't you just do the deliverance? Like, Lord, please, I really want my, I really want this breakthrough. I really want, like, you're literally $1,000 in the bank walking by a homeless person that's asking for $5, saying, Lord, please send someone to give him $5. God's like, or just take it out of your pocket. I mean, we pray these prayers that we could answer. Why don't we stop praying prayers we could answer and start praying prayers that are so illogical, so impossible that only God can answer. And this is biblical. You're like, this isn't biblical. Jesus said... Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers out. Think about this. Pastor Ken, Jesus is saying to the disciples, pray that God would send the laborers. Who are the laborers? They're the laborers. Jesus was saying, pray that you'd go do it. It's like you didn't get the hint. Jesus is going, you guys are the ones that are going to be the answer to the prayer. And you're still sitting around going, how are we going to feed these people? And Jesus is like, I'm going to multiply the bread, but here's what he told the disciples. You're going to hand the bread out. Jesus did not hand the bread out to the, uh, the 15,000 there. Jesus handed the food to the disciples, and the disciples had to go into the crowd and feed the hungry people. That is why this church is called Without Walls, because God is giving us the bread of life, and the walls of the church, they don't hold us back, but we're going to go out and feed this city the bread of life. So here he comes, telling the, ch tell the church of Ephesus, he, I'm almost done. He says this, I know your works. I know, I'm not here to say you're not working. I know this has felt like a real beat me up sermon. That, that's all my sermons, okay? Go on my YouTube channel, it's like WWF. I'm beating up everybody every time I preach. It's not, so I'm like, well, this is harsh. Now, if you're new, Pastor Ken is preaching next week. He's way nicer than me, okay? He's way, like, I cannot bring my cousin to this. He's way nicer. Come back next week. And if you come back and don't like it, then find another. But if you could come back, come back with someone's a little nicer. They won't beat you up as hard. But we're going to beat you up and fix you up, okay? We're going to tear down the old, and we're going to build up the new. We're not just tearing down. We're building up. So he says, I know your works. So before, because we're about to get rebuked here in Revelation chapter, I'm not even doing it. It's just John here. So don't get mad at me. Get mad at John. When you get there, be like, John, you're, you know. So 
He says, I know your works. So it's not like I don't know what you've been doing. I appreciate the hard work. So in one side, God's like, I know the work you've been putting in. Amazing church, by the way. Ephesus was one of the biggest churches, one of the most powerful churches that in the entire day in the entire area in that day and he says I know your work so in one side it's like I know the hard work you've been putting in and then the other side is like I know your works because because here's the thing we all come to God as if we're super radical and on fire and we pray like we're too and we're at the altar and we're here at church and God's like I know you 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 don't pray like that at home you don't worship like I I've I've prayed at times where I'm in front of like all these mega church pastors and famous people and they're like will you pray and I'm like sure and I, yeah, I get up there I'm like I decree and declare that the Elijah mantle's coming on the sun and I get up there I'm praying these like and they sound so good they're so flat and dead because they're religious but I'm like I know that they're gonna impress everyone and then as I've as I was praying one day doing that at, at, a, at a service I heard the Holy Spirit be like I know you this is what he was saying that's not how you pray like, why are you faking it, acting like you're this radical man of God when God is like, I know your works. It's like when pastors introduce me to other pastors, like this is Isaiah Saldivar. He has, you know, hundred million views on his show and he's reaching people. And I love it. Thank you. I'm flattered. I appreciate it. You know, I don't want you to introduce me to like, this dude's a loser. I, I appreciate you introducing me. Okay. In a nice way. But while you're introducing me, it's like the church of Sardis, you're giving them my reputation. You're giving them the, what people know about me. But here's the thing, you know one thing about me and I'm real, I'm not saying I'm a fake. I'm 100%, ask my wife, ask my kids, ask anyone. I live this 24 um, seven, I don't turn it off. All I talk about when we go to lunch, well, all we're gonna talk about is God, God, God. There's nothing else in life that matters. I eat, breathe and sleep the presence of God. But here's the thing, God, God says like, I know your works, Isaiah, because in your mind, this is all of us, we think that we're better than we really are, including myself. We have this lofty view of ourselves, but then Paul said, examine yourselves to see if Christ is even among you because we have a tendency to think we're way better than we really are. And then when we get around people that are really about it, like martyrs, we're like, oh, I'm not really that good. Like, if you ever play like ping pong or you played whatever, right? We, we, when our revival first broke out, we were playing ping pong after service because we had a ping pong table right there at the house. So we were playing, you know, we thought we were super good. We were playing ping pong every night. We, we were like, man, getting good. And so I thought I was like hot stuff. I was like, I could top spin, back spin. I mean, I was straight up looking like I just straight out of China, just king of the ping pong table. Just, I was the guy, right? And so I was like, you know what? We're going to go to the local ping pong club, which I don't even know if those are still around, but we went to this local gym and they had a, a ping pong thing. And so I was like, hey, you know, we're here. We've been practicing. We're going to, we're going to show you guys up. I mean, we literally thought we were like five of us guys. We thought we were like super good. We had these like custom paddles that were like a hundred dollars and we're like, we're really, really good. And we get there and they're like, oh, we'll play you. We'll see where you rank. Right. Because it's like, you have to get ranked. There's like beginner, there's intermediate, there's expert, there's pro. There's like seven or eight different levels. Then there's like unranked where you're so bad. They can't even rank you. You're like playing with the kids. And so we're like, we're going to play these dudes. We're going to show them up. We walk in there, guns blazing with our little custom paddles. That everyone's just staring at us. And so we're, friend, I couldn't, we couldn't even return one serve. We literally, these guys were spinning it, making it, I mean, you're talking about, I had nausea watching them spin the ball. They were spinning it so hard. And so after we're done, they were literally like, oh, you guys would be unranked. Like, we literally were like, we're ready for the expert. We were com considered unranked. We thought... We were really good around each other. But when we got around people that actually did it for real, knew what they were talking. See, some of you are measuring where you're at based on all the lukewarm people around you. But Paul said, examine yourselves according to your faith. So some of you think you're an expert here and you're unranked. And you're like, man, I'm a man of God. And then I think about like, when I get to heaven talking to the apostle Paul and being like, you got stoned. I mean, did you really get stoned and you got shipwrecked? And Paul's like, what'd you do? And I'm like, oh, I went to church. He's like, what do you mean? Go, you went to, how do you go to church? Like, oh, well, you know, the thing on Sunday, we go for an hour. And Paul's like, do you have any stories? And I'm like, uh, not really. And then I'm like, I don't even think I'm a Christian. And I'm not trying to get you to doubt your salvation. I'm just saying the level in America is so low. It's unranked. But we all think we're these giants. Like, I would take down Goliath. I'm like, you can't even share your faith at Starbucks. Like, we're like, Lord, send me to Africa to get martyred. And God's like, or just share your faith with your cousin one time. Like, guys, we have, we have such a low-level Christian in our everyday lives. And so he's writing, saying, I know your works. He says, you labor, which 
when did labor become a cuss word in the church? Like God wants us to labor in this house and labor. I learned this in 2022. To do what God wants you to do is an extreme amount of work. I'm right now building a new studio. I've been there 12 hours every single day for two weeks. I've been nonstop. It's all I've been doing. And not, I'm like, God wants me to do this. And it's an extreme amount of labor. If you think it's going to be easy, you are wrong. Jesus said, what man goes to build a building without enough money? If you're going to build a house and you know you could only afford the foundation and the framing and you're like, well, I don't even know what I'm going to do. And you build that house and then the whole neighborhood's like, what happened to that house that was being built? But you, didn't, you couldn't afford it. The Bible says everyone's going to laugh at you saying, why would you start building something, doing something, knowing that you didn't have enough to finish? So the goal is I'm going to come into this thing this morning saying I need to know what it takes. It takes it takes work. It takes labor. And then the third thing was, he says, I know you, your patience. It takes patience. I got to keep sharing and keep preaching and keep prophesying and keep showing up to church and year after year and helping in this ministry and doing this for God. And there's patience because it's not instant like Instagram. I have to plant the seed and I have to wait for the seed to grow. I know your work. These are things we need in 2023. By the way, if you're not catching what I'm trying to say, I know your labor. I know your patience. I know, fourth thing, that you don't tolerate evil people. So what is he saying? Jesus is writing this literal church. Like imagine him writing you a letter today. And Jesus is saying, you're not this bad person. You don't like evil. You don't tolerate evil. You're at church. You're coming every week. You're working for the church. You're laboring hard. You're patient with people. You're patient in your faith. There's endurance. And then he says, I know that you've tested these apostles that claim to be apostles, but are not really apostles. So like you're, you have discernment. You're not letting these random speakers come in here preaching this watered down, greasy grace. And you're not in, up in here preaching some watered down. Like you're preaching it real. You're not tolerating fakeness, false apostles. He says, nevertheless, now the scary thing about nevertheless is nevertheless means everything I just said really doesn't matter compared to what I'm about to say. Like you did all of this good stuff, but what I'm about to say ruins all the good stuff that I said prior. And he goes, nevertheless, I have this against you. Imagine God, and I'm almost closed. The worship team can come up. Imagine God saying, I have this against you. Let me ask you this question. Don't raise your hand. Don't say it out loud. What does God have against you this morning? I know that we've painted God out to be, or Jesus out to be, like just this su super nice guy, which he is a super nice guy, but he's also a guy with judgment. He's also a God that is righteous. He's also a God that doesn't tolerate. He's also the God that looked at the rich young ruler and said, unless you sell everything and give it to the poor, you can't follow me. And the Bible says the man walked away sad. And Jesus did not chase after the man. Jesus was strong. He's the one that killed Ananias and Sapphira for lying. So I know we do have a nice God. And please, I will never paint picture Jesus in a wrong picture. But we also have a God that says, unless you lay everything down, you can't be my disciple. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Imagine God saying, Isaiah, I have this against you. You've left your first love. You no longer love me the way that you used to. I have this, to, think about this. I have this against you. You spend too much time on TikTok. And I've gotten trapped in the portal of TikTok where it sucks you in and two hours go by and you've scrolled through 4,000 mind numbing, pointless videos. And you're like, what am I doing? And it's like, I call TikTok digital fentanyl because we have a generation absolutely addicted, spending eight hours a day. This is what TikTok says. Their analytics, eight hours a day, some kids are spending on it. And we're hours and hours. And God says, I have this against you. You don't pray anymore. I have this against you. You don't love me the way you used to love me. I have this against you. You spend way too much time at work and not enough time with your family. I have this against you. You keep skipping out on the prayer meetings to go do what you want to do at the baseball game and the football game. I have this against you. You don't think about me anymore. My thoughts outnumber the sand on the seashores, but you don't, your thoughts are nothing about me. Like God says, my thoughts about you outnumber the sand and you've had five thoughts about God this week. I don't think about God enough. Isaiah Saldivar, this is like a public repentance here today. I mean, I'm just spilling everything. I don't think about God enough. God says, I have this against you. Your thought life is impure. I have this against you. You're not walking holy. I have this against you. You haven't fasted in 15 years. I have this against you. You are a glutton. You're obsessed with food, but not obsessed with my presence. I, so he's writing saying, this is New Testament after the cross. I have this against you. And this is what I have against you. You have left your first love. 
One translation says this, you don't love me like you did in the beginning. I remember, and this is why I started with my testimony. And I, I packed a lot into the last 50 minutes, for real. Because I'm like, man, I preached my testimony. I, pre I mean, We went a lot of places, okay? Don't, it's a lot, I know. But I look at my testimony that I rarely share. I need to share it more because it's not my story. It's his story. And I look at, and I get, I get emotional when I talk about this. So let me just have a second here. I look at the boldness I had, the hunger I had, the passion I had. I could remember leaving six hour prayer meetings just so I could get home and pray for another four or five hours. No joke. I used to, used to, and that's the scary word. The scary word is when Isaiah's sentence just started with, I used to. I used to pray eight to 10 hours every single day. My brother got saved because he didn't believe I was really praying that long. And he would sit by my door for hours and listen to me pray when he wasn't saved and say, I thought he was lying. And he have tears in his eyes saying, how do you pray for eight to 10? I would go to, I would pray all day, go to bed praying, wake up in the middle of the night preaching. I'd wake up into my body. I'd be standing up in my room preaching. This went on for months. I would fall asleep, land on the ground, wake up on the ground, wake up literally praying in the spirit some days and then pray 24 seven. I didn't have anything else but God. I lost all my friends. I gave everything up. It was like, I was a disciple. Like, I was like, man, this is like what they did in the Bible. I laid it all down and I was obsessed. But here's what happens and it's not bad. It's not always wrong, but life happens. We get married, we have kids, we have finances, we get the house, we get the car, we get the career, we go to college and slowly but surely, God doesn't leave us, but we leave God. And we're 10 years later going like Samson between two pillars saying, how did I get here? Some of you are in this room right now and you're looking at your life. I have chills all over my body. I feel what you feel. And you're looking at your life and this is what's going through your head. How did I get here? Like I've been going through the motions of professional religion and I've lost my first love. And I'm, it's not, please, please. How, it's not like you're not doing it. You're in prayer. You are going, he didn't say, well, you don't go after me. You don't work. You don't labor. You're lazy. You don't pray. He wasn't even indicting them of that. His indictment was, you're doing all of this stuff, but you've left the reason why you started. You've lost the passion for doing all the stuff. Isaiah Saldivar, I am consumed by everything that I'm doing right now. I gotta build a studio. I gotta reach more people. I streamed 400 hours last year. I posted 1,100 videos. What? I'm, I'm, I'm all, and God goes, dude, you've left your first love. You don't even love me. You are so busy working for the king, you don't even know the king. You're like an employee at Amazon. You don't know the CEO. God never intended for us to be employees. He intended us to be friends and sons and daughters. Some of you are like an Amazon worker thinking that you have a relationship with Jeff Bezos. You're like, I know the CEO. It's like, and God's like, no, you don't. You're so disconnected working for me, but never knowing me. And God is not looking for a corporation. He's looking for a family. He says, you've left your, nevertheless, I have, you've left your first love. Notice this, and I'm almost done. Give me like three Pentecostal minutes. He didn't say, he didn't say you left church. Wow, that's a strong statement. He didn't say you've left church. He didn't say you've left your wife. He didn't say you left your kids. He didn't say you left fasting. He didn't say you left your commitment. He didn't say you backslid. He said, you've left your first love. And that's worse than all the other things. He says, so here's the, now this sounds like ter terrible news and it's actually beautiful news because God's giving us a word to repent today. So here's the three things he said, if you're in the, this place, and by the way, if you didn't catch the message, I'm in that place. I could stand here and say, I've left my first love. Why? Because I don't love them the way I did in the beginning. That's what one translation says. You don't love them the way you did in the beginning. But here's the beauty for Isaiah Saldivar and for every single one of you that traveled in and every one of you that flew in. The reality is Isaiah Saldivar has nothing to offer you. I know that sounds terrible to say because you're like, well, I flew all the way here. So a man of God can lay hands on me. Friend, you are stuck in the old covenant. You are stuck in the old Testament. There is a new priest and it's not Isaiah Saldivar. It's the high priest that forever makes intercession on your behalf. Jesus said, I am Jacob's ladder. I give you access to God. And today, whether I lay hands on you or whether sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. Today is your day to return. Why well, came to get a demon cast out of me? This is better than deliverance. You want to know why? Because you could get a demon cast out of you and still die and go to hell. 
You could get a demon cast out of you and God say you've left your first love. Going back to our first love is infinitely the most important thing we could do this morning because it's what God is speaking to us in this house. He said, here's what you need to do. Three very basic. I'll never tell you all the problems without giving the solution. Very basic. He says, you need to remember where you fell from. So, I re- so for me, this is how it goes. I remember how I used to be hours and hours in prayer, didn't care what anyone thought, going out evangelizing. I would literally be praying and I'm not kidding. And God would say, and this happened on countless occasions. I'd be in prayer and God would say, there's a lady in a wheelchair. This happened multiple times. There's a lady in the wheelchair tonight at seven o'clock at 7-Eleven on Main Street. I want you to go pray for her. I kid you not, me and my uncle would go seven o'clock sharp on Main Street at 7-Eleven. There'd be a lady up front in the wheelchair. We'd come and pray for her. There's going to be a guy. And I would go around the city. I didn't care. I didn't have a big name. Nobody knew who I was. I wasn't neutered by religion or, you know, commercialized by the, by the internet. I was just raw. I, didn't, I would say the craziest things. My uncle couldn't even let me go out in public by myself because I would be prophesying over the squirrels. I was just crazy. He says, remember. So for me, that's re- I'm remembering. Man, I used to go out. I need to go out and start praying for people more. I need to go out with this obsession again. He says, remember, repent, repent. This is all it means. Change the way you think. You, th- Ugh. you think wrong about God. You're thinking that God is this little God in a Sunday morning box. Change the way you think about your life, about God, about your destiny. Change the way you think. So remember, repent, and then the third R, and I'm not trying to give you a Baptist three-point sermon, okay? The third R is return return. God doesn't say, I'm going to come back to you because God says, I didn't leave you. You left me. Stop saying, God, come back. God goes, I didn't go anywhere. I've been in the same place. You're the one that walked a hundred miles away. So now I know where I fell from. I'm changing the way I think about God. And now I'm going to go right back. I'm literally going to go right back to where I was, reconnect with God. And then God says, if you don't do this, now, not everyone's going to do this this morning. Some of you will walk up and walk out and be like, that dude was crazy. And you're 100% right, I am crazy. Here's what he said. If you don't do this, he told the church, I'm gonna remove your lampstand. The light, the effectiveness, the power, the illumination is going to be gone. You are going to be a stale, dead, ineffective Christian without the light of God in you if you don't do this. Here's what history tells us. Ephesus did not listen. They became a city plagued with mosquitoes and bugs. The water that was running up to Ephesus shore receded, I think it was like over a hundred miles back and it became a plagued, deserted city. Do you know what the water receding represents? The water represents the Holy Spirit pulling back from that church, pulling back from that city, and it became a dry, dead place of destruction. And God, I am saying, God, I don't want your Holy Spirit to recede back. I don't want you to withdraw today. Everybody stand on their feet. Today is the day where I'm returning to my first love. Thank you so much for joining the Without Walls YouTube channel today. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a live stream or video, and make sure you share it with a friend. And if you want to stay connected with all that's going on, make sure you download our app today so you don't miss a thing. We look forward to seeing you soon and have a great week.